Hi, I'm Nino Gonzalez, and welcome to another episode of Making Sense. Well, today I have the pleasure of bringing back an old guest and an old student, well, not old in age, but a previous student from El Paso Community College. And I was fortunate enough to do about several shows with him during the start of this program of Making Sense, and it was during the early uh, 10 first episodes. And I'm glad he's back. So we have John Summerford. John, welcome to the show again. Always Good to a see pleasure. a, a you know, blast from the past. Oh, yeah. But, um, <laughs> you know, as, as I mentioned, you were a guest several times on my show when I started it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we talked about several different topics. And you transition now from EPCC to UTEP, correct? Yes, I am now a full-fledged minor. Wow. Well, tell me a little bit about yourself. Give, give us an update on what you've been up to. Well, I'm over at uh, what we call COBA, the College of Business Administration. Um, I'm studying uh, you know, business uh, administration with a specialization in human resource management. Great. So uh, it's been a long road, but I'm almost done. So I'm getting Great. pretty close. So, so how much longer do you have before you uh, get your bachelor's degree? Uh, one year. One, one year. year. Great. And so good to hear that success story coming out of from El Paso Community College and transitioning to UTEP. And I want to thank you for helping me in those those first few shows ah, when yeah. I started the program and good to have you back and good to see you again. Oh, it's always great, you know, it's always great. Well, you know, let's let's talk about um, a topic that um, a lot of people don't understand and that's the time value of money. Yeah. Do you know what the time value of money is, John? Oh, man, it's been quite some time since so I took your class okay. and let me see, uh, basically uh, how it grows with interest. And how it grows with yeah. interest, yes, basically uh, like that. So uh, we do that a lot in financial planning seem to see how much we need to save maybe on a monthly basis or that's what we call a present value and how much it's going to grow to mm -hmm. if we invest it at a at a rate of return and that's what we call a future value mm -hmm. and and that's basically in in basic terms what the time value of money is so present value is an amount without interest and future value is an, is an amount with, with interest. interest but you've got that power of compounding mm -hmm. and and, and talking about this is this is what uh, financial advisors, a lot of accountants do too, in, in advising their clients and in helping their clients achieve their goals, how much money they want to have for retirement or to save for their uh, college kids' education, whatever the case might be. Mm -hmm. But let's take a look at a slide. We've got two individuals here, and they started putting away, well, one started putting away money at the age of 19. And this mm -hmm. shows you the power of time, especially when it comes to retirement, not to wait. But if you, we take a look at the at uh, Ben, and he started at the age of 19, investing $2,000 a year for, I think, what, uh, eight years? And then he stopped. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you see, that column is just zeros. Then we have Arthur. He didn't start at 19, but he waited until 27. And then he started putting 2000 every year until the age of 65. But look at the totals. Yeah. Uh, ben, who only invested 2000 a year for eight years, has more money, $2,288,996, compared to Arthur, who started late and invested even more. Now, well, why is that? You know, like, why is it that a person who starts so early and, and so quickly Still gets more well, money. Well, there's that uh, Rolling Stones song. Yeah, with time exactly. It's on my is side. On my side. <laughs> you know, uh, the sooner you start, the uh, the better you'll be off. So that's that's the key here, and and that's the power of compounding, compounding interest. So what that means is that you're earning interest not just on your initial investment, but what that has already earned. Now this mm -hmm. is assuming a 12% annual rate of return. Now you're, you're saying, well, 12%, that seems a little bit bit high. Where am I going to get that? Yeah, I mean, that's a, kind of a rarity to hear about. Well, let's, let's just talk about those rate of returns. Whenever you see a percentage, it's always going to be APR, what we call annual percentage rate, or APY, annual percentage yield. So mm. whether you're buying stuff on credit or you're investing, when they tell you it's 6%, that's 6% a year. So interest is always stated on a yearly basis. So we've got to understand that when we're looking at, at um, financing commercials for cars or home loans or, or whatever, uh, that interest is always stated on an APR, annual percentage rate. 
So if we go and think about, let's say we go to the credit union or a bank, oh, of course. And, and we put away money in a savings account, what do you think that savings account is paying on an annual basis, the mm -hmm. rate? Oh, I want to say, what, maybe 8%? No. <laughs> no, no, I, don't know. Well, no I, I wish a savings account would pay 8%. Savings accounts are paying a, a, about less than 1%. Wow. Yeah, less than 1% interest. So, so that means that if I invest a dollar in a savings account, at the end of the year, if it's earning 1%, I'm going to get a penny. <laughs> you know, yeah, then what's the point? Right. Well, you know, you need some money in well, savings, yeah, of course, for emergency purposes and stuff like that, and that's very liquid. And mm -hmm. and you do want to set up a savings. And and one of the things that I always suggest is to start saving some money away, even if it's a little bit. Start with five hundred, then make it to a thousand, then make it grow. But we want that available, even if it's paying low interest, mm -hmm. because it's available for emergencies if we need it. But that's not going to make your money grow for investment purposes. Right. So we can't just dump it into a CD, a certificate of deposit, or a savings account because they're going to be paying less than 1%. If you're lucky, you might get a little bit, a tad little bit over 1% in some situations. So where do we find like a 12% or maybe even a 10% rate of return. Where would you think, John? Well, uh, I think maybe stocks, bonds, investing. And, and you're, you're exactly right, the stock market. So people uh, should not be afraid of investing and getting themselves a little bit educated. Now, a, a lot of individuals come up to me, oh, I want to invest uh, money in, in this company. Mm -hmm. I never suggest that. Unless you have a lot of money, I don't suggest that you invest in individual stocks. What I suggest is you maybe look at some funds. That's better, and it's a lot easier. Now there's two types of funds, and there's mutual funds, and there's index, index funds. funds. And, and they sort of act the same way, mm -hmm. except that a mutual fund is managed. And that means that you have a manager who's managing that fund, picks the companies and the investments that he or she wants to make, but since you have a manager, you're paying their fee. Yeah. So, so their fee to be in the fund is gonna be more than it is in an index fund. An index fund is almost like a mutual fund, but it mimics indexes. And there's a whole bunch of different indexes that um, Wall Street or, and business um, look at. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and they're, they're not, they're, they're passive investments. So that means they're not actively managed. You don't have a manager running those index funds. So therefore, the expense ratio, which whenever you're investing, you should always take a look at that expense ratio. And we usually want that to be below 1% because that means you're keeping more money. Exactly. And some of those monies are not, uh, some of that money is not going back as fees. And as money goes back in fees, then that decreases your rate of return. Now, my question is, um, a lot of people are interested in uh, uh, investing in index funds and mutual funds, and you know, you hear people talking, but uh, they always end up wanting to go through a bank. Now, is that a good decision to do? Or? Well, usually banks have some investment services, but again, a lot of them have higher fees. So, but you can do it yourself. So, let's talk about index funds. You know, and, and we we talked about that they're not actively managed, and basically they follow an index. So, one of the things that we have is the S and P 500 and that S&P stands for Standard & Poor's. Standard & Poor's 500. It's made up of the largest 500 companies and in different sectors. So you've got them in entertainment, pharmaceuticals, oil, transportation, utilities, banking, name it, retail, whatever. So they're the 500 largest companies. So usually in the news or on financial websites such as Yahoo or um, MSNBC or what, whatever, you know, uh, and you'll see these numbers that the S&P 500 and how they did that day, whether it was up or it was down. So that's guiding how those 500 companies did in that particular day. So when you, and there's, a, there's an index fund that's mm -hmm. called the S&P 500. Yeah. So when I invest in this fund, I'm investing in the 500 largest companies in the world mm -hmm. or, or in, in the U.S. In, in the U.S. So and you're diversified. You're yeah. not stuck in one single industry. A and so if we take a look at the S&P 500, and we're going to put that, that slide up, but if you take a look at 
I, I put a historical uh, rate of return on the S&P 500 and it, since 1973 to 2014. And as you can see in some of these years, look at 1989, the rate of return was 31.5 percent. Mm more yeah. than that 12 percent. <laughs> if we go further down to 2003, 28.7 percent return. Uh, if we take a look at 2009, 26.5 percent rate of return. Uh, 2013, 32.4. And in 2014, 11.74 percent. So getting close to those 12 percent. But of course, you see some negative numbers. Yeah, there. There's negative. Fluctuation yeah, there's here. fluctuation. If we take a look at 2008, it went. It was at a negative 37 mm -hmm. percent. But as you can see, if you take a look closely at this uh, illustration, you have more positives than negatives. And you've got to ride the market. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to invest, you can't pull out when it goes down because then what's going to happen? It's going to eventually go up, and you need to leave it in there. So you need to just set it and forget it and you when we're talking about it, when we took a look at that first diagram and we're assuming an average annual rate of return of what 12 percent that's taking into consideration all the ups and downs, and downs okay and you, historically the stock market and I'm talking about the stock market in total has been about 12 to 15 percent you know and that includes uh, you know uh, a lot of the downs like uh, the Great Depression, we had the recession, mm -hmm. we had 9-11, we had Black October, you know, a, a lot of big downs, but overall the stock market has bumped back. Yeah, that's true, that's true. Um, now, should people actually kind of worry about when the stock goes down? I've heard people like, oh no, it's a good thing because you could buy more. That's exactly right, yeah, because then what happens is that you're, you can buy more shares if the price goes down and then it will recover, but what a lot of people don't understand is it goes down and they want to get out. Yeah. And and that's usually bad. You got to be able to ride the storm. And like I said, time is either on your side or it's not. And and one of the things is you've got to be able to tolerate that the stock is going to go up and the stock market is going to go up and down. It's it's the nature of the market. Mm. Uh, but it's it's real interesting when we take a look at at those returns that overall it's been averaging a little bit over what. 10%. 10 percent. Yeah. So that's where we're going to find those returns and we got to take a look at those index funds. And, and there's index funds, uh, there's the total stock market index fund and that in that one I'm investing in every single company that's listed on the, the stock market, not just the 500, but the total stock market. So I'm invested in every single company that's out there, whether they're doing good or what? Or bad. Bad. Mm -hmm. But sometimes if a sector is doing bad, another sector could be doing good. So you're very diversified. And there's also the Russell 2000 Index, which uh, tracks the performance of smaller publicly traded companies. And then there's specialized funds, you, like for example, if you like technology companies, there's a technology fund. If you like green companies, there's a green fund. I, if you like uh, real estate investment trust companies, there's those type of funds. So there's a whole bunch of funds out there that you can invest in. And what, what I want to let the public know is that they need to research these things. And, and we'll talk more about how we research those and how to take a look at these funds on the second half of making sense. So we'll be right back. Welcome to the second half of making sense. And in the first part, we were talking about um, how to make your money grow, the, time, the concept of time value of money, and we were talking about rates of return and how whenever you see an interest rate, it's stated on an annual basis. And we were talking about uh, where do we find these investments that pay 10, 12, 15%. We were talking about different types of funds and specifically index funds. So that's where we left off. Uh, yeah, um, and also I was bringing up the earlier about uh, going to a bank and talking to uh, people there about investing and right. they know how. And you had mentioned that 
you know, you'd have to pay a certain fee for their services. Is it worth it to go to a bank? Account? Well, it all depends on how much money you have. You know, uh, usually, um, if, if you're a small investor, I would suggest the do-it-yourself approach, if you're comfortable with that. Because again, if you go and ask services from somebody, they're going to charge you. And whatever you pay to them, that's going to, of course, go against your rate of return. So what I would suggest is, is there's a lot of investing sites out, out there. There's, uh, for example, Fidelity, there's Vanguard, there's Schwab, there's E-Trade, and, and you can open up these online. So that's the very first thing you have to do uh, before you start investing in these funds. You've got to open up a brokerage account. And it's almost like opening up a bank account. So a lot of these forms, you fill them out online. There might be some forms you have to maybe electronically sign or or maybe they mail them to you and you, you sign them or you can fax them back or email them back. But uh, fairly simple. And a lot of these funds, one of the things is that you can't get into them right away. Um, some of them require, depending on the company, require a minimum investment of maybe $2,000 and up before I can participate in that fund. So if you don't have that money, then open up a brokerage account and start dumping money in there into a savings account. Mm -hmm. And that savings account is, of course, going to pay you interest, maybe a little bit better than 1%, <laughs> a little bit over 1%. But you're, you're putting money away in there. And before you know it, let's say you put away $200 a month. In 10 months, you're going to have that $2,000. And then you can start investing in that, mute, in that, not mutual fund, but an index fund. And then anything after that, you can increase it into the index fund. Mm -hmm. So if you're putting away 2000 once I get the 2000 then the other 200 will go into that index fund because I'm already participating in that fund. Ah, okay. So that's the very first thing we have to do is you have to you have to open up a brokerage, brokerage account. account. Yeah. And and index funds it's not just for uh, I'm talking about personal investing but also you can put these into your retirement accounts or if you're saving for uh, your kid's college education and to those 529 plans, which, which basically they have these funds and you can invest in those. So mm -hmm. these funds are available for IRAs, individual retirement accounts, 401k plans, which are usually employer-sponsored accounts, 403b plans, which are for nonprofit and, and, and state education and, and state, um, usually, uh, a state government. Mm -hmm. For example, here here at the college, we have a 403B plan. And uh, so these funds are available uh, through through any type of investing that you're doing, whether I just want to invest this money in this fund, or I want to do it through my retirement account, or through my kid's college savings plan. Okay. Now, with all this uh, talk of investing and stuff, now, it brings me to the question, well, how do you actually look into what to invest in? I mean, how do you research right. this stuff? Well, you know, you can go, again, to Fidelity, Vanguard, and, um, or E-Trade, or Schwab, and you can do some research, even without opening an account. And usually they have a search bar, and you can type in index funds, and it'll bring up some index funds, and then you can start clicking on them, and you can, uh, you, for example, we talked about the S&P 500. Mm -hmm. There's an index fund that's called oh, okay. call that. Mm -hmm. Or you have the total market index fund. And there's even an, an index fund that's an international index fund. So you're investing in international companies. And, and so you can go in there and take a look at their performance. And that's where you'll see the rates of return. You know, you'll see them, what it is today, what it's been since January, what it's been for a year ago, three years ago, five years ago, ten years ago, depending when that fund was started. Mm -hmm. And you can sort of see a perspective and you can see if those are earning those rates of return that you want. And not only that, it'll tell you whether that, how much of a minimum you need to invest in that fund. And then very important is that expense ratio. And we want to take a look at that expense ratio. A lot of index funds have an expense ratio of maybe 0.10%. Uh, you know, maybe 0.25%, but we don't want to go over, what, 1%. That's my recommendation mm -hmm. because then that is money you're paying to the company and you're not keeping. And, of course, that lowers your rate of return. So if, I, so if my average annual rate of return is 10% and I'm paying a 3% commission, so I'm really only making how much? 7%. Yeah. So we got to be real, real important and take a look at that expense ratio. And that's, that's what I gauge myself on. Mm. 
I mean, that sounds like a lot of <laughs> information that, <laughs> to take in there. Like, yeah, and, and wow. you know, one, one of the things is that um, you have to become educated and don't fear it. Yeah. You know, don't don't fear it. Yeah, because uh, I always, uh, like, especially on uh, the UTEP campus, I'm hearing a lot of students, like, the Wall Street Journal's becoming the thing to read right, right now. You know, I mean, that's just, you know, it's what you read. It's your Bible when it right. comes to investing. That's, that's great. So uh, I don't know if, um, do, would you actually recommend it? Or? I, you know, I don't know if you remember, but uh, when you were a student in my class, but I always used to talk about the Wall Street Journal. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I subscribe to it and I, I get it daily and I read it on a daily basis, but that's that's the, the business publication. And not only that, it, it's not just covers business, but so many more articles and very well written, a very well respected newspaper. And, you know, it just opens up your eyes to so many different things mm. in business. Mm, interesting. So, you know, it does take, take some um, research. Mm. It does take some, uh, a little bit of do it yourself. But once you get comfortable, diligence. you know, yeah. once you get comfortable with it, then you, you just set it and you forget it. And then uh, you might want to maybe invest in that S&P 500 or the total market or maybe a foreign fund or a utility fund, whatever, you know, as you get more comfortable, uh, you can start doing that. Now, uh, you're speaking about foreign funds. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on what these foreign funds actually are, what these foreign Well, companies? they're investing in companies that are not, not traded on the American stock market exchanges. So you might be investing such as in uh, Shell, you know, oil or, uh, uh, Sony or Mitsubishi, you know, uh, Toshiba. All, y y yes, <laughs> a, a lot of those foreign companies that are included in those funds. Mm. And usually, when you research on that, it tells you the ten major with uh, the the ten major holdings that that company has. So you can see uh, that that fund has. So you can see in 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 what companies that fund is investing or what it comprises about, oh. or like Nestle or so forth. You know. Mm. So Nestle's not an American company. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, let's talk about another thing. You were talking about the Wall Street Journal. And um, the Wall Street Journal is, is, is a Dow Jones publication. And, and there's an average out there that's called the, the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Mm -hmm. And um, you, sometimes in the news and on Yahoo, you, you'll see DG, DJIA, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, or you'll see the Dow. Yeah. And sometimes you'll hear the Dow is up. The, the Dow, Dow is down, down, you know, the Dow is up, the Dow is down, and they tell you by points. So let's, um, and I think a lot of people don't know what that means, what the yeah, Dow yeah, means, no okay? Clue. I remember when so, I first started. So, so the Dow is made of the 30 biggest companies in, in the nation. And if you take a look at these companies, you've got 3M, you've got Apple, Caterpillar, Coca-Cola is in there, GE, Home Depot, you've got Pfizer, Microsoft, Nike, Walmart, Walt Disney. So those are the 30 companies that make the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And you can see uh, the industry that they're in. And as you can see, it covers basically every single industry. Mm -hmm. You've got from uh, consumer finance to computer networking, technology, fast food, banking, entertainment, retail. So it covers everything. So mm -hmm. when you're hearing about the Dow, it's how these 30 companies are performing. And companies can be put in and out of the Dow. The one that has been consistently in, you know, it's been out a few times, but not for that long as GE, General Electric. They're the ones who have been in there since the inception, basically, mm -hmm. of, of the Dow. So they, they calculate, they go through this formula and they calculate that Dow Jones Industrial Average. And just to give you an idea, the Dow in the 80s, in the early 1980s, was just over 1,000 points just over a thousand points. Okay. Now, if you hear the news, it's almost inching to 18,000 points. Wow. wow. I know, and what is that showing? The growth, the growth That's of the economy growth. and the growth of the company. So if you put it into that perspective uh, in, in the 80s, you know, and we were, that's when I was going back to college at UTEP, and, and we were taking a look at the Dow, and you know, oh, it's going to get to 2,000. Wow, it's like, that was, that was a <laughs> highlight. You know, but now we're talking, it's going to break 18,000. <laughs> you, you know, uh, when you put that into perspective, so that's how, how it's grown. So when they tell you that, that the Dow is up or mm -hmm. the Dow is down, they're referring to that average that is being calculated on these 30 
biggest companies that are included in that calculation. And usually we can assume that if these 30 companies are doing well in those sectors, then we can assume the rest of the companies yeah. are doing well or not well. So basically, uh, it's kind of a reflection of how well the economy is doing. Yes, yeah. it's a reflection. These are what we call indexes. And that's, that's what index funds invest in, in mm -hmm. those what? Indexes. And there's a whole bunch of indexes out there. There's the NASDAQ index. The, the NASDAQ relates basically to technology and computer companies. And there is an index fund that invests in technology and computer companies. Or, and there's an index fund that invests in healthcare companies, medical companies. So if you want to specialize, you can. And if you want to be in that particular type of industry, you can. But what better than to be in the total stock market index fund, where I'm invested in every, every single company, or maybe the S&P 500, where I'm invested in the 500 biggest companies. Mm -hmm. So, so, but there's so many funds out there, and all it, all you need to do is is do a little bit of research. Like I said, go to one of these sites. You don't have to. You don't have to become a member. You just type in the search bar "index funds," and then you start looking at these index funds and look at the performance. Mm -hmm. And that's where you see these these uh, annualized rates of return. Right. And you're going to see some ups and downs, oh, yeah, and of course, and I mean, you'll see fluctuations. Yeah, and that's 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 how the market the market does. So let's talk about uh, what happens when you hear, let's say we hear in today's news, yeah. the Dow is up 35 points. So so what that means is that, just to put it in, in I guess in, in basic terms, is that those stocks are going to, uh, are costing me more, $35, $35 more today than they were yesterday. Mm -hmm. So if they tell me the Dow is up by 100 points, those stocks are costing me $100, $100 more today than they were yesterday. So if they tell me the Dow went down 400 points, then those <laughs> stocks are costing me now $400 more, or you've lost $400 more in value in those stocks. That's exactly than, what I was yes, ask. That's, so, so that's how you read the Dow. That's in basic layman's terms. So that's, that's how you read the Dow, and that's what that means. So now when, when our public looks at the news or they look at websites and they say the Dow, what does that mean? Well, at least we have an idea that it's made yeah. up of those 30, 30 companies, and, and it's, it's an indicator of our, of our economy. Well, you know, John, I want to thank you for coming by. Time went by so quickly. Yeah, uh, as always. <laughs> I, I hope uh, our public got a little bit of investing knowledge. I'm not an investment advisor, but uh, you know, I'm just trying to, to pass on uh, the knowledge that I've used in, in my personal life and try and share it with the public. And we'll see you on another episode of Making Sense. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.